Was there an Adam? Was there an Eve? Or did we evolve from what we conceived? Either way, we got what we needed when the sun shone down on the Garden of Eden. Don't you know we're gonna have a solitopia, solitopia, solitopia? Don't you know we're gonna have a solitopia all over God's green world? Well, we bit that apple and the garden was lost, and so we had to work to pay the cost. And so we went digging into the ground and started to burn many things we found. But <laughs> oh yeah, we started to burn too many things we found. That's the fantastic Dar Williams singing with Pete Seeger. <clears throat> I gotta clear my voice here. And uh, David Burns, the Solar Topia song. Man, we are really winners today. <clears throat> the huge blue rainbow wave is sweeping over the world. We dodged a, an incredible bullet at, at the uh, in, in collection, and we're going to talk about it today. I'm getting an echo here, but uh, hopefully it'll go away. Uh, and this is Harvey Sluggo Wasserman at the Solartopia uh, uh, Green Power Wellness Show on PRNFM. Thank you, crew in New York. And we've got some uh, really important uh, and great guests to uh, to discuss what the amazing things that are happening uh, with our electoral system and beyond. Uh, Steve Rosenfeld, are you with us? <clears throat> Steve Rosenfeld, are you with us yet? And uh, John Brakey, you here? I certainly am, Harvey. How are you? Hi, buddy. How are you? Um, um, Very good. Mr. Craig, are you, uh, uh, hello. Uh, who else we got with us today? Clifford Kasner. Cliff, okay, you've jumped in. Clifford J. Kasner of I the did. Uh, Southern, Southern California <clears throat> Americans for Democratic Action. Um, uh, uh, a- Andrew Craig, are you with us? Hello? Okay, so listen, we got John Brakey and Clifford Kasner to start. Uh, Steve Rosenfeld uh, and Andrew Craig may be joining us. Um, but listen, there is so much news to go into, uh, and then I'm going to jump to you guys. Uh, we'll, we'll be lucky to cover it all in an hour. Uh, first of all, I've just heard, <clears throat> and it's been confirmed, uh, that uh, the uh, Florida governor's race is now within uh, recount territory, that the counting of new ballots and, or, or mail-in ballots or provisional ballots has dropped the margin of alleged victory uh, in Florida uh, below 0.5%. John Brakey, I believe you're in Florida. Uh, can you tell us what you've seen about that? It's it's incredible what's going on here, and uh, I've been here since Sunday. And uh, uh, in the in the Scott Nelson race, it's a strange thing. Uh, you know, that's on the top of the ticket. That's the top, and they found in Broward County thirty thousand undervotes. Okay, and the oh, next oh, God. below that is the governor's <laughs> race that only has five thousand. Okay. And so something is really wrong. And yeah, a lot of people is are pretty excited wrong. about it. Right. Uh, so uh, let's do, I think Steve Rosenfeld is also in Florida. He may be having a uh, phone uh, trouble. Steve Rosenfeld, have you joined us yet? Yeah. Okay. Well, he'll, this guy on here. Hi, oh, you are. Here. Are you also in Florida with John Brakey? No, no. Right now I'm in uh, Savannah, Georgia, outside of the, the Chatham County Board of Elections. Which looks like my um my public okay, my so, elementary school in the sixties. <laughs> so you guys, uh, we have Steve Rosenfeld in Georgia, and um, and John Brakey in Florida. Uh, are you guys like watching for Klansmen riding by uh, and burning crosses, or are we in better shape than that? No, I don't. Well, it's so. interesting. I don't know if I um, have an answer to that, but you know, it's definitely a red blue election. And it seems like the red calls the uh, the Democratic side communist, and the and the blue side calls the red side uh, fascist. And it's uh, a, a time in our country that I think it's a very dangerous time. Yeah, it is. It's a, a serious time. Andrew Craig, have you joined us yet? Okay, so Andrew was going to talk to us when we get to it about the uh, Jeff Sessions firing. 
Uh, Clifford Tasner, you're here in Southern California. We've had a ground yes, swell, or, or, or an earth-shaking um, um, election here as well. We've seen the departure of the dreaded uh, Dana Rohrabacher. Um, to hit the high points real quick, in California, Clifford Tasner from the Americans for Democratic Action. Uh, what do you see has happened here in this election? And then I'm well, going to go in you know, it's, and it's give a frustrating a, a election in a lot of ways because uh, our battle in California is between less about Republicans and more about the split in the Democratic Party between the corporate Democrats and the progressive Democrats. You know, we were we were very excited about Kevin DeLeon's uh, candidacy against Dianne Feinstein, who now that with the departure of uh, Joe Donnelly and Heitkamp and uh, Claire McCaskill, Diane Feinstein is now the second most conservative Democrat in the U.S. Senate. But she's coming from one of the most liberal states, so it's a real strange matchup. But uh, Kevin DeLeon surprisingly did uh, fairly well. He got about 47% of the vote. Now, a lot of that was disgruntled Republicans who are low-information voters and uh, misogynists, and they're angry at Diane Feinstein for somehow impeding Brett Kavanaugh's you know, coronation to the Supreme Court. Um, we also... Uh, what, what happened, there were some very important ballot measures, and, and a very, very good ballot measure that's very necessary has gone down, and that is Prop 10. Prop 10 would have permitted, uh, it would have repealed the Costa Hawkins Act, which prevents rent control, uh, effective rent control from being enacted, and it would have allowed cities and municipalities to enact meaningful rent control. We have a real serious rent crisis in California where so many people just can't afford to live in the cities anywhere near where they work. And uh, people are spending more than 30 percent of their rent on uh, their money on rent. And uh, it went down because the industry, the uh, landlords, especially the big corporate landlords, uh, spent about 80 million dollars to defeat it. And we had another wow. ballot measure, another ballot measure that would have uh, uh, enacted some limits on the amount of profits that the uh, dialysis, there's two major dialysis companies that are gouging, 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 d d desperate people, and uh, they spent uh, something like 130, 115 million, sorry, dollars to defeat that measure. And the thing is, that kind of money works. People are susceptible. Yes, we did. People uh, do not have critical thinking skills, and they watch ads, and they become alarmed, and they vote. So anytime we put something good on the ballot, corporate interests spend millions of dollars to defeat it. And any time they want to put something on the ballot, they just hire signature gatherers and run a deceptive ad campaign. So that's what we have in California. But now the thing that everybody wants to talk about is the Congress, the flipping Congress seats uh, from red to blue. And uh, we've done a bit of that. We have, uh, there's a few races that really are too close to consider decided, considering how many provisional ballots are still out there. So in the 25th district, Katie Hill has actually defeated Steve Knight. And that's up in the uh, great. Florida area, north of. And Har Harley Harley Ruda defeated um, Dana. Harley Rohrabacher. Ruda defeated the, the um, uh, you know he defeated uh, the execrable uh, Dana Rohrabacher, whom we won't miss at all. Except we did like his and, uh, marijuana legalization stance. That was the one thing that he yes. Was good so on. the bottom line, also by the way, and then we're going to go back to the national picture now uh, in a minute. Uh, we also California did also, and I don't want to lose track of that. The voters of California actually uh, approved a continuation of the gas tax. Uh, it's a, it's That's quite right. a that remarkable thing. thing when you get uh, the voting the Republicans the voting cynically put out. it on the ballot. The Republicans put this Hoping on the ballot, a repeal of the gas tax, in hopes of, of uh, in diminishing the uh, in lack of enthusiasm among people for because of Trump to get their people out. And what happened was eventually the campaign actually ran out of money. And they just ah. didn't have as much money to spend as the various building right. trades who are really glad. That, and, uh, and we, uh, have a small and we, gas and we did, we did keep building roads. We did keep the gas tax, and there, and, there, and uh, so there'll be fuel. My car will not again hit a pothole out here that will cost me hundreds of dollars. And uh, so that that's, right. that's a really good thing. Andrew Craig, yeah, twelve cents yet? gas tax is a lot cheaper than the amount of damage that the bad roads do in terms yes. of productivity. And exactly. Exactly. So that was okay, one. Good so we're going to come back. We're going to come back to California. Uh, we've got Steve Rosenfeld in, uh, in Georgia, John Brakey in, in Florida, and things are really popping. So I want to give a little uh, a talk here real quick. I want us all to, to meditate for a moment. Uh, and by the way, I'm sorry there's all men on this show. I did invite Jill Stein uh, to join us, but I haven't heard back from her. So um, it, it will be a guy thing. Uh, and I'll do a, a, an all-women's show as soon as I possibly can. The bottom line here is, uh, I think we all understand this, is that the United States of America and the world dodged 
a huge bullet in this election. Had the Democratic Party not taken uh, control of the House of Representatives, we would be looking right down the barrel of a complete fascist takeover in this country. I, I don't think it's necessary to uh, apologize for maybe overstating the case, because there is no overstating the case. Had Donald Trump been given two more years of total control of the Congress and of the judiciary and of the executive branch, this would basically be a fascist country. This was a pretty good, you know, I, we could have wished for more. This was a pretty good blue wave. And what it really was, was a rainbow wave. Uh, you know, the most important statistic, as far as I'm concerned, and, and you guys can jump in and talk about this, is that uh, the, the polls show that two-thirds, more than 60 percent of the voters under the age of 30 uh, voted against Trump in this election. It's not so much that they voted for Democrats, because the Democratic Party, as Clifford uh, uh, alluded to for California, the Democratic Party, the corporate Democrats, really offered virtually no leadership and no counterbalance to Donald Trump. The only really effective speakers out there who were, uh, you know, uh, counteracting Donald Trump on a national level were, of course, Bernie Sanders and, and then Barack Obama jumped in. Uh, but, and, and, you know, we're seeing in the New York Times and elsewhere a downgrading of the progressive impact. This was a progressive election. Uh, had it not been for the, the young uh, and mostly female energy that came in to this election to oppose Donald Trump. And we have to make it clear, there is no more Republican Party. There is a Trump Party. This, Repu this party that calls itself Republican has no resemblance whatsoever to the party of Lincoln or even of Eisenhower, for God's sakes, or, or even for that much of Bush one, maybe Bush two, and a little bit of Ronald Reagan here. But the bottom line is that the De Republican Party is over. It's the Trump Party. And uh, God knows what will happen after Trump. But in the meantime, we've got this guy in the White House who wants to be a dictator and, uh, and, and who wants to crush the media. And had he won this election, had the Republicans not been defeated and, and a substantial a ma a majority of Democrats come into the House of Representatives, this would be, uh, you know, we would, we would be looking for other countries to go to with people on this call and other progressives listening in. I mean, there's, is that serious? The bottom line also, further, is that this was a rainbow election. We have had the first two Muslim women going into the U.S. Congress, the first two Native American women going into the Congress, the first openly gay governor of a state, Jared Paulus, in, in Colorado. Um, and on the, the average age, I believe, of the Congress, at least of the House, has significantly dropped now. Uh, we have very progressive women uh, uh, now in the Congress in leadership roles. I mean, I'm certainly not a fan of Nancy Pelosi, but she is the first female uh, speaker. And, uh, and, you know, so this is, this is what has happened here. And I, I know it's easy to understate, uh, or, but the bottom line is that we have dodged a very, very lethal bullet here. And I want to mention also, I, we had Andrew Craig lined up. I don't know if he's going to join us to talk about the sessions firing uh, in a classic Trump fashion. Uh, you know, the last thing that Trump wanted to talk about was the election. So the day after the election, he fires Jeff Sessions. Now, this is, you know, this is Trump. Had it, uh, had it not been Jeff Sessions, he would have opened fire on the caravan or, uh, you know, done something, uh, anything to divert the media uh, from, from this huge loss that the Trump party has suffered. Now, the, there's also an incredibly important election in terms of what we uh, John Brakey, uh, uh, Steve Rosenfeld, and I, and, to, and Cliff, I'm sure you too, have been working on, which is election theft. And I want to say that the most important and moving, I watched the coverage on both CNN and NBC on election night. It was, it was awful. I mean, we, we, we have an election here in Mississippi, where the first time since Reconstruction, well over 100 years, that we have the possibility of a black U.S. senator coming out of Mississippi, they never discussed it. And we're now going to have a, re, a rerun in Mississippi. And I hope Steve and, and, and John and all the election experts go into Mississippi and make sure there's a fair vote count there. Because, uh, it, you know, to have a black senator in, this, in 2018 come out of Mississippi would be earth-shattering. But the most important thing, and I'll, I'll stop talking in a minute, uh, the most important speech that I saw 
on election night was Stacey Abrams refusing to concede. And she was so powerful. And this is such a huge deal, this uh, recount now in Georgia. I was so disappointed that, um, that Gillum uh, conceded in Florida. But it looks like now there's going to be a recount anyway. So we have Georgia and Florida now on the cutting edge of finally breaking through on, on election theft because these are going to be extremely closely scrutinized elections. And, and, uh, and, and we need to really look at Mississippi. It's ironic it's all coming out in the South, but, but that's where it's at. So let's start talking about it. Steve Rosenfeld, you're in Georgia. Uh, uh, John Brakey, you're in Florida. Let's start with you, Steve. What are you seeing, seeing there in Georgia, and, and why are you there? Well, um, I just got here to Georgia um, because I wanted to see how they're wrapping up all the uncounted votes. And there are several categories of uncounted ballots, and they're being handled in different ways for different reasons. And, you know, when you get into the weeds of that, that's where there's been a lot of the ob- obstruction and the fights in court. And um, I wanted to really see how a state that basically earned the reputation for being the most anti-voter date in, in the fall of 2018 is handling things. And I got to tell you, it's very different from Florida. You know, you, you, they're, they're right across the border from each other. And in many ways, northern Florida could be southern Georgia and vice versa. But their, their systems, their election cultures are different. And uh, it's very, very striking. I mean, I, I, you know, Harvey, I don't know that it's true or not. And John is down there and he can tell you more because he's in Broward County. But you know, I spent a lot of time looking at the system that's used to count votes and then audit or basically double check the accuracy of every ink mark um, in up in northern Florida in the state capital county, which is the same system they have in Broward. And I, it's there's nothing like it in the country. That's what I came to see. It's it's literally it's literally hacking proof because the only because you're using two separate computer systems and the only thing in common is a piece of paper that can't carry, you know, viruses. And, um, and I think that's why Gillum, I think that's why he conceded. I think early. I think he looked to see where the votes were, and they weren't there, because they have a, an incredibly trackable system. And Georgia could not be more opposite. So I'll leave it there, and we can pick this up, this thread. Um, you know, okay. what I heard in Georgia, yeah, by the way, is that, you know, Stacey Abrams needs, Stacey Abrams and the Libertarian need to take about 25,000 votes away or get ahead by 25,000 votes for to, to turn this governor's race into a recount, into a runoff. And I've heard from people working inside the Democratic Party that they think there maybe are 30,000 uncounted votes left, ballots left. So that's, that's a very steep climb. Yeah. So that's, that's the latest real numbers I've heard today. Uh, John Brakey in Florida. By the way, uh, two in New York, we have a, I have an email from Andrew Craig saying he's trying to call me, and um, I don't know uh, what we can do about it, but if, if you see someone uh, c- trying to call in on the line, please, it might be Andrew. Uh, John Brakey, you're in Florida. Uh, uh, what are you seeing there? Well, it's, uh, it's exciting being in Broward County because they've discovered that in the senatorial race, that uh, which they don't report their unders and overs, that there's 30,000 votes missing in that race. Okay, in Broward. And that's a pretty serious thing. And it's on the top of the ticket. And usually the top of the ticket has the less undervotes because the next race below the senatorial race is the governor race. And there was only 5,000 undervotes there. And so if there truly are 5,000 in these, there's 25,000 missing ballots. And that is probably that race, if it continues the way it's going to go, it's going to go into a hand count. Because to get a hand count, you've got to be less than a certain number, I think less than 0.25. I think at 0.5, you get a machine recount. And, uh, and, you know, and, and so all of this is adding up to you know, quite an election, uh, a lot of problems. Uh, you know, I'm getting ready to release a big story, I think, or release, is that I was successfully able to get video of how these cellular phone modems that are built into these uh, precinct scanners which, uh, you know, is a serious problem. 
and they shouldn't be here. We did a report on it two years ago, and uh, and then a report came out from most of the top scientists in elections uh, saying the same thing we said, that this must stop and get rid of. Uh, the thing with uh, talking about Mississippi, I've already drawn up a uh, – uh, what I call a track condition report for Mississippi because I was requested last night, so I worked on it, you know, half the night. Uh, it's been tough to hear. I'm averaging about three hours sleep a night uh, just trying to keep up with everything that's going on. And cause, but I'll say this, at ending it, is that I think Florida has a tremendous potential of becoming a Maryland. They've got great uh, records request laws. What Stephen's talking about, about this clear ballot, it's clearly a, a, a good situation. And if we had publicly verified elections on top of that, I think that Florida is going to turn a curb real big because the felons now can vote in the next election here. And, they had, and that's going to add a million people to the voter rolls. And if we can prove that elections are transparent, trackable, and publicly verified, and they matter, I think more people will vote. But, but right now, if we don't do that, I think people who uh, voted are walking away in some elections wondering, you know, like Mark Twain would say, is that if elections were real, they wouldn't let us do it. And there's people like that that have doubt. And we need to keep our franchise active, alive, and people participating and know that their vote really does matter. Uh, um, for Jay Tasner in California, have we had any similar problems with the ballot? Oh, of course, not there. Okay, um, and Andrew Craig is trying to uh, call in because we want to talk yep. more about this sessions firing. Um, uh, have I heard someone? Yeah, Harvey, I would just sort of say you asked a question about how does you know California compare. I'm not obviously I'm not in California. I'm in Georgia. I'm a Californian who is reporting in Georgia yes. after being in Florida. But I can tell you that the uh, the, the, the slowness of which California. Um, is, is reporting these results, like, like you were saying earlier today, that you have the results in this congressional seat and that congressional seat. It's because they, they, too, in many ways, have similarities to the Georgia system, where it's, um, it's, it's, it's bureaucratic. It's a lot of heavy bureaucracy instead of more efficient transparency, accounting, and double-checking. And, you know, maybe people in blue states don't want to hear that they're being compared to, like, the, the worst red state offenders. But, uh-huh. but but it's true. And, and you know, where John is, it's really interesting. You know, I, you know it's a big question. It, it seems to be, with, you know, accepted as a fact now that 30,000 people didn't vote in that U.S. Senate race in Broward County. And um, the things I'm reading about it today is that the ballot design was weird and confusing which is a complete deja vu echo of 2000 butterfly ballots, Southern California. Yes. Yes. I I mean, I don't, you know, the thing about this is no one is going to know for sure, but, but, and John can tell you this, they have an audit system there that is not the one that tabulates those votes. And if the people really didn't mark that paper, you know, they're doing these scans and they're probably done with them right now. If John can get the records to these, um, you will literally be able to go through with an ent- see if based on an entirely different, you know, independent system. You can look through those those the, those thirty thousand where there's no marks, and you'll see it. And you can do it very efficiently. You can do it with a team of people in probably a matter of hours. Um, so I'm just just saying that's that's the difference. Wow, it's a big difference. You know, it, it's a wonderful system. Uh, you know, it's built off of basically what happened in Humboldt County. Uh, that's how Larry started it. And, uh, and you know, it's definitely uh, these digital images are going to do a lot to help people uh, gain trust back in elections, especially if they make them publicly verified by precinct. So basically now, uh, you, of course, John, have been on, on the show advocating these um, uh, digital image machines. Um, are, have there been some of these machines in the digital image machine to, to clarify for our listeners, you fill out a paper ballot, you put it in a computer, uh, a slot, a digital scanner. Uh, the computer, the digital scanner reads the, uh, the paper ballot. It uh, preserves the paper ballot, but it gives a digital image of the paper ballot, which can be counted and accurately recounted. So this is really a, a double, uh, blind system that c- can produce us. Um, a, a good recount 
um, and a reasonable uh, method of tracking these elections. Were any of these machines in use in Georgia or Florida uh, or in California, for that matter, in this election? Uh, not uh, in Florida, you bet. Uh, Steve, what is it, three counties? Let Steve answer that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Harvey, I mean, actually, what, let, you know, let, you, let, you, what you explained to your listeners is actually half of it. So let me just, let me, I've, I figured out how to say this very simply. You have paper ballots that go into a tabulation counter. And these tend to be a range of older to newer machines that basically can take images and do. And John's fighting to have all those images saved. And they mostly are just adding, you know, scanning scanners. They're adding up the ovals and they're totaling them. What, 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 what we're seeing in the best of these counties in Florida is that's a tabulation scan. The same paper ballots are then moved into a completely secure, and I mean like ID requirements and security like I've never seen around elections, into a single room where they're scanned through a much more high defi- put through a much more high definition scanner. And they're done and they're, they, they're created, they create an inventory of those images based on every single machine used. It's not just a precinct mix, it's down to the machines used. And then they have this incredible software that um, can detect and assess the, the confidence of the, the way people mark those ovals. Sometimes people circle them. Sometimes people make an X. And you can go through them, and you can, you, you, it's like an accounting puzzle where you can actually a- account for all the marks and the mistakes and things like that. But the point here is that you have two separate systems where the only link between them are the paper ballots. And that's how you have a, as believable accounts as you're going to get based on minute reading errors of scanners. You know, I've never seen this anywhere else. And, and you know, when it comes to, like, pulling the ballots to examine them in real recounts, you know, this second scanning system, this audit system, you know, you, you know everything goes into a box. You can just count down. It is, you can just pull them out in, in a matter of minutes. If pe- and, um, you know... How many, uh, how many companies make these? How many companies make these machines? Uh, right now, the one well, that I'm talking about, there's there 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 are a handful of companies, and they make a spectrum of better to worse machines ar- around images. And I won't. And the problem with this stuff is, um, it takes time to scan these ballots, and uh, and the machines that are used for tabulation and uh, and the counting tend to be older and slower. The oldest and slowest are by this company called ESNS. The ones that are slightly faster are by this company called Dominion. And the ones that are the best is this te- teeny-weeny company that mostly started doing these, these, the audit side of this called Clear Ballot. I mean, they, they, they do both. But, but the genius of this, is, and I've never seen anyone talk about this anywhere, Harvey, really, honestly, is you have two independent systems that have no electronic link at all. The only link in common is the paper ballots that are scanned. And you can then... So these can't be hacked. These can't be hacked. They cannot be. These are, they, they can be hacked only one way. Supervisor of elections or the person who has like keys to every single system and every single you know encrypted you know thumb drive would have to you know he, you know you would have to synchronize more you know somewhere between a half dozen and a dozen you know key places because there's so much redundancy in these for backup and security. It's it's I would say it's almost impossible. No one from the outside can hack these things. There's no there's wow. no bridge. There's no link. The and only if you really want to make it impossible, marry the ballot to the image, which they can, and then the Senator Ron Wyden's bill is use risk limiting audits to prove that the images are real, and then you can get up to a ninety nine point nine confidence rate. And how expensive are these machines? They're off-the-shelf um, scanners. You can go buy them off the shelf. That's the good thing about them. That's what he's using, and that's the beauty of it. The DS850, we don't know what kind of hidden software is in it, okay? So we, have, we now have – we can now say – this is parallel in my world to the, the, the pushing of renewable energy because we now have technology off the shelf that can completely replace all the coal, oil, nuke, and gas facilities – in the world, yeah. you know, solar panels, yeah. windmills, batteries, and increased efficiency. The, bit, the yeah. four horse people of the uh, anti-apocalypse here. And so now yeah. we have a similar 
technological leg up in the uh, in the, in voting? Are you saying that, Steve Rosenfeld? Yeah, I'm saying that the people who put this together, which you know were the people who basically were at were trying to do. People who put this together were the people who were trying to do the full recount in Florida before the U.S. Supreme Court stopped it. And they have stayed in the world of voting and fast forwarded it, you know, nearly two decades. And starting, you know, literally a decade ago, they started creating and testing and building this system. And they, they have really – I've never seen anything like this, Harvey. I, I, honestly, there are so many decision points where they made the right choice in terms of – ballot security and accounting. I mean, you don't have to do these things where you go in and make a statistical analysis saying there's a high probability that the outcome is correct. You can, it's an, it can be an accounting process where the public, if they really were interested, like doing what John's doing, can go in there and, you know, and, and, and see for themselves. Now, you know, nothing is perfect in this world, but boy, the problem with this is that, or the challenge with this is that, um, these are newcomers in an industry. It's like Apple throwing the hammer against the screen, <laughs> the IBM machine at <laughs> the Super Bowl. You uh-huh. know? And, 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 and in the next, in the next um, you know, in the next 6, 12, 18 months, three quarters of the states are going to buy new voting systems. And, they're, and the, the old players, the ones that are using the stuff that's not transparent, that's not saving good images, that's clunky, that's opaque, you know, they're the dominant market players. And it's very hard to get people to uh, just to see, you know, what can be done. And, um, you know, so that's a forward-looking challenge. But as far as the election this week, I... I right, well, wait one second, know, I Steve. I want to encourage you, Steve, before we go into this, uh, I want to encourage you to do a major piece on... I will. And w- maybe collaborate with John Brakey. And, and then, you know, and so we can put it around and uh, enforce this, because we know that the uh, impact of solar panels and windmills and batteries and increased efficiency, those four basic technologies are, are changing the world. And one of the transitions that we're going through here with Donald Trump, A, you know, we're, we're seeing a global transition from uh, male control to female control, and B, we're seeing a global transition from coal, oil, nukes, and gas to renewable energy. We could be making this uh, change into renewable energy without the technology, which is now at hand. Now, we, you, you, John, me, um, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of other folks, Mimi, Kennedy, and so on, have been fighting for election integrity. If we now have a technology that can make this possible, um, you know, a, a simple transition to a new kind of machine, that's a huge deal. I mean, it's not going to stop these guys from stripping voter rolls and, and, and doing that stuff, but at least we can find a way to guarantee a, uh, a reliable vote count. Once they're cast. Well, is that right? Really, listen, John, John's there. And I saw it. I saw it in different Florida counties than John did. I mean, John, what do you think? Am I am I exaggerating this stuff? Not at all. Not at all. Steve. All right. Yeah, so we are the first good. radio show to talk about this, I'm sure. Um, uh, maybe you guys should just go uh, get jobs working for this company and start selling this stuff. I mean, I'm out pushing solar panels on houses in Southern California. But uh, if we have a technology that can help solve this horrible problem, at least the, the, the uh, flipping part of the strip and flip, uh, that, that is a huge deal. I want to check. Andrew Craig, did you ever get on the, on the call here? Yeah, I'm here uh, enjoying the conversation. Okay, and Clifford J. Tasner, are you still with us? I think Clifford signed off. Okay, so listen, guys, um, I, I, before I, I go to uh, – Andrew Craig is going to talk to us about Jeff Sessions and the firing. I want to make sure that we get a good, uh, solid overview of this election. Uh, first of all, you know, it, whatever it is, it's, it's beyond a blue wave. It is a rainbow wave. We got rid of two horrible governors, uh, one in Illinois, Bruce Rauner, who is just a, which I've seen discussed nowhere in the media, by the way, but he's a horrible Republican. <laughs> we got a Democrat in who's actually richer than he is. Both of them are multi-multi uh, millionaires, but uh, it's a huge change in Illinois. Bruce Rauner was horrible, and then the, the Satan himself, uh, Scott Walker, has been defeated in, in uh, Wisconsin, uh, which is a, a also a tremendous liberation. Um, we, we have the uh, first uh, female governor in South Dakota, a, a uh, Republican, by the way. Marsha Blackburn, for all her um, bad politics, is the first 
female senator from Tennessee, and we've had a, really a, a, a rainbow wave of, of gays. We have, I think, 119 women in the Congress, which is the highest number ever. Uh, we, we have a, uh, 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 a first openly gay governor in Colorado. Uh, the list goes on and on. For two first, first two Native American women Congress people, first two Muslim women Congress people. Um, uh, and, and above all, thank goodness, uh, we have averted an outright fascist coup. I can't even begin to, and I'm sure all of you uh, will agree with me, we, could, we can't even begin to describe how we would be feeling today if the Democratic Party had not taken uh, the House of Representatives. Uh, it, would be, uh, it would have been an apocalyptic event. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, to, to move ahead now, I believe, and I'll let you guys comment on this, and then we'll start talking about Jeff Sessions here, I believe that um, uh, the key in the next two years is who's going to control the Democratic Party. Um, as I said earlier, two-thirds of the people under 30 voted for the Democrats, and those people are bound to be way more progressive than the generation that came in with the Clintons in the 1980s and is still hanging around in the presence of Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and, and Tom Perez. And so the, the struggle for this country is now boils down to the struggle for the control of the Democratic Party. Uh, you know, the Republican Party is gone. It is no longer the Republican Party. It's the Trump Party. It, and, and, and the next two years up to 2020, I'm actually, uh, it has to do with who's going to control the Democrats. I'm actually going to put out, and I want you guys to give me feedback, uh, tonight or tomorrow, a petition on Move On and Elsewhere, uh, politely requesting that Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton not run for president in 2020. Uh, and that we have an open field, finally, uh, where new blood can come in. And I'll let you guys comment on that, and then we'll talk to Andrew about uh, Jeff Sessions. Uh, Steve, Steve Rosenfeld, uh, what's your take? Steve, you still there? Uh, I yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, oh, you are. My take is this. Um, it was definitely a blue wave. It was a wave election, and when I saw... <laughs> You know, Fox News saying on Wednesday morning how it's not a wave election. It's not a wave election. I thought, well, there's a confirmation for you. <laughs> but, here's, yeah, right. but, here's why, <laughs> but here's why it was a wave election. Um, you know, the, if you take a look at the uh, dashboard at the New York Times um, website on all the election results, where, you know, you know, millions of votes are still going to be added by the time certification is done nationwide, because a lot of states are still counting. The Democrats right now, there were 13 million more Democratic votes nationwide in the U.S. Senate races than, than votes for Republicans, you know, even though Republicans control the chamber, which is, uh, you know, an, 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 maybe the, the biggest gerrymander of all. Thanks yes. to our Constitution. And, and there were about three million more votes um, for Democratic candidates in the House that gave us gave the Democrats the House majority. Um, so, you know, those are really big numbers. And, and as Michael McDonald, who was the University of Florida voter turnout expert, was, was discussing, he's estimating, he's saying this is the first midterm election that has more than 100 million voters, period. It's probably going to get up to 111, 112, 113, something like that. Um, there's, there's no way you can not call this a wave election. Now, some of these people were voting Republican for, you know, for Trump. And, and, you know, that's one thing that, you know, when you live in California, you forget there are really conservative parts of the country. And being in northern Florida, I'm very much reminded of that, and Georgia, too. But, um, but the energy was on the Democratic side. And, um, and if you take a look at beyond the candidates who won and the, the great diversity, um, there, were, there were some important electoral reforms. Probably the biggest is in Florida, where... Yeah. In, in a state where it was neck and neck over the U.S. Senate and, and the governor, more than, I think it was 64 percent voted to reenfranchise 1.4 million eligible former felons, one of four states that had permanent lifetime felon voting bans. That is, that is beyond significant politically. It's going, to ch it's going to change the complexion of the state for years to come because those people, even if only 10 percent turn out, 10 percent of that 1.4 million you know, turned out and two thirds voted Democratic, you would have Andrew Gillum as governor today. Um, and, 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 the, and, you know, the people here who voted for that included a, a lot of 
conservative religious voters who believed in second chances. That whole campaign was framed as a uh, almost a redemptive, you know, it had very big religious overtones, not just poli- they, they, they de-emphasize the politics, they emphasize the moral overtones. And then in other states, you had red states saying, hey, it's time we join the Affordable Care Act and expand Medicaid. And we're talking about, like, you know, Idaho, these Rocky Mountain, inner mountain states, completely red. Um, and you, you had the lock that on the Republican lock on the upper Midwest, where the three states that gave Trump his, his smallest final winning margins, Michigan, um, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, now have Democratic governors. And uh, even though in some of those states there are Republican supermajority legislatures, those governors will, will veto a lot of policies, including gerrymandered maps, which means the decade of the 2020s will not be the same as the decade of the teens that we've been living through with these, you know, extreme, you know, Republic, extremist Republicans controlling all branches of government. Um, and, yeah. You know, you know, and and there's, you know, a realignment going on politically where the South, you know, people here talk about this um, new South, and it's, it's a little bit of a dream, and it's coming closer to a reality. I mean, Andrew Gillum, Stacey Abrams, if she wins, Beto O'Rourke, you know, they are within the slight, slightest, they're at a tipping point where, you know, progressive candidates are, are almost able to win major statewide elections. And, you know, change is slow, but these are all very positive signs. Uh, on, the other, on the other hand, the states that are now making the Senate more Trump-like, um, you know, mean that the federal judiciary will continue to be stacked by right-wing judges, which, you know, that side of the aisle really likes and our side is very much concerned about. And, um, you know, and like you say, it's not, a, it's not the Republican Party that's based on principle or, 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 or principles. It's based on, you know, copying Trump. But... Um, but there you go. So okay, overall, very good. Yes, and we got I, what's probably the most astonishing development in the last two years has been the absolute unanimity of the Republican Party uh, lining up behind Trump. You know, you had Jeff Flake who kind of flaked out, and uh, Corker in Tennessee, and uh, then uh, Lisa Murkowski who voted absent on uh, Kavanaugh's nomination. Other than that, not a peep of opposition from the Republican Party. It's astounding, and, and it, it, you know, it is a transformation. Uh, and on the other hand, like you say, and Steve, you put it well, this uh, transformation on the, the blue side of the aisle into a rainbow, uh, th- that, that's what's really critical. Um, John Brakey, do you want to come in, and then we'll have Andrew Craig uh, tell us about Jeff Sessions. Clifford Tasner, well, I don't think The us. only thing that I can add to, you know, especially what Steve said, and I think Steve was very profound what he said, is that, I'm hoping that there's a love illusion coming and that we are going to turn. And, and, you know, if we get the black yeah. box made into a transparent box, we fixed a small part of the problem. But we still have other problems with gerrymandering, which is really a bigger problem that, uh, that Steve writes about so much and elegantly. And then, of course, micro-targeting, psycho-targeting. I know that the only thing I'll do is if we get the black box to a transparent, then I can start looking at ballot harvesting, ballot stuffing, and things like that, because vigilance is what we always need. And thank you for having me on. Absolutely. And, you know, the question now, the really big question now is race, as always. But uh, we're, we're getting down to the nitty-gritty here. The rubber has hit the road. You have a black woman in, uh, in Georgia basically – uh, on the brink, uh, certainly standing up to a Klansman, uh, forced his resignation uh, from the uh, Secretary of State's office. This is really, uh, and the two, the two recounts in Florida, again, a black man running for Senate. Uh, Governor, this is really uh, where the rubber hits the road now. And a black man with a chance in, in Mississippi, for God's sakes. I mean, who thought we'd be saying that in 2018 when the last, uh, the only black senators uh, came out of Mississippi uh, back in the 1800s, uh, and it didn't last. So uh, this, this a corner is being turned on issues of race and sexual preference and, and gender, of course, in our electoral process. And if we can get rid of this divide and conquer thing, we could probably enter the 2020s in much different shape. And, and part of that now has become the, um, the, Mueller, the Mueller investigation, this great black box, which, you know, could be, on the one hand, you want to say, well, maybe this is a big diversion. Uh, but on the other hand, there's been a lot of indictments 
And there, there you know, there's certainly in the right wing media, there's a lot of talk about the son of the president being indicted. Um, uh, Andrew Craig, give us a look at this. Tell us what you're working on and what do you think of this uh, Jeff Sessions firing and where is it going to go? Well, before I do that, uh, let me take about 20 seconds to locate uh, myself uh, in place or time because I think it's relevant. Uh, as you know, I run the Justice Integrity Project, which is an investigative uh, uh, small organization based in Washington. But we're on Pennsylvania Avenue within about a baseball throw of the Justice Department headquarters and the FBI headquarters. And, of course, the Justice Department is where Jeff Sessions worked until yesterday. And uh, I was a couple minutes late getting on the call here because I'd gotten a tip that um, some activity on this was going on at the federal courthouse, which is three blocks in one direction down the street. And, of course, the Trump Hotel and the White House are about <laughs> three and seven blocks in the other direction on Pennsylvania Avenue. So um, I, I'm in the middle of things, but I didn't find out anything at the courthouse. Uh, whatever happened uh, was quiet. But uh, uh, with that intro, um, well, we know that, Sessions was the first uh, major elected official to support Trump, and he's vigorously supported him uh, on his horrendous agenda at the Justice Department, and yet he was ousted over the recusal matter. And it's uh, something of an irony that um, Sessions, which has had a, a truly horrible uh, career in my investigative reporting experience going back to the 1970s uh, as a biased, bigoted, and ultra-right-wing uh, prosecutor and senator and attorney general. Uh, it's ironic that he's being bounced out solely because he did the right thing legally and recused himself from the Mueller investigation. But that's where we are. And, of course, uh, Trump then appointed, in a very dubious maneuver, uh, a Trump loyalist um, named uh, Matthew Whitaker, who had been the chief of staff of the Justice Department, but really should be looked on as a, a partisan Republican from Iowa who ran for the Senate there. Um, and Whitaker uh, earned his job by being a commentator notably on CNN last year. And uh, in it, he tried out for the job by saying that the Mueller investigation was uh, improper, illegal, and uh, should be stopped. So uh, that's the situation where theoretically he's now in a position to stop the investigation, thwart it, um, in a variety of ways that we won't necessarily know about, uh, at least until um, uh, the Democrats try to bring him or his colleagues forward uh, in January. But in the meantime, there's huge concern over uh, uh, what might happen to the most serious uh, um, likely indictments in the Mueller obstruction of justice and corruption investigation of the Trump campaign. Well, do we officials. do we think there's a do we think there's a there there? I mean, do we think that Mueller really has something? I mean, he's, he's certainly um, uh, resulted in a number of indictments, or is this all just big a diversion? I mean, you're well, right in the middle. I, of it. I, I we don't know the, what's in that. I've uh, covered this closely, including covering the Manafort trial. And uh, I know that there are people, including on the left, uh, who are so um, upset with Hillary Clinton and other uh, corporate Democrats that um, uh, they'd like to think it's a diversion or, or improper. 
But uh, my view is that Trump and his associates have a long and documented record of corruption uh, extending back decades, and that um, this is not a time uh, for uh, people to do anything except look at the evidence and realize that uh, uh, whatever the old battles about Hillary and uh, and Bill Clinton are, uh, that Trump is corrupt, Manafort is corrupt, and this is a huge danger to um, anything that we would think of as uh, a decent and normal America. And if people... So do you... Like but Mueller are think, investigating it. Uh, we need at least to know what they what they're finding. Let me ask you this question: If the Mueller, this is theoretical, if the Mueller, if what Mueller has, and we assume that he's pretty close to, uh, I mean, he's been at this a while with all the resources that you could want. If Mueller's report was made rep- public today, what do you think would be the impact? I know that's a wild theoretical, but it's important. What do we what do we think we're looking at here? Is 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 what Mueller has uh, going to uh, could it actually have an impact on 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 the American political scene? Oh yeah, forward? I think it would um, uh, it it would likely result in uh, many high level indictments extending throughout the. Uh, Trump family and administration and uh, multiple counts of Trump himself being an unindicted co-conspirator. And what that would lead to is um, an impossible um, uh, situation for him to continue his most dangerous activities short of war and that would have to be looked at carefully uh an unjustifiable war uh, but uh let me bring your listeners some news today uh my uh longtime friend uh Wayne Madsen has wor- a former navy intelligence officer and a very uh hard-working uh, and expert. Okay. Uh, a- Andrew, you're going to have to talk a little quicker because we're running out of time. Okay. But well, we want, I definitely today, want to hear what you're going to say here. Uh, uh, on his website, a 3,000-company relationship chart that he's developed oh, God. and published uh, privately, and it's called the Trump Manafort Kushner uh, Criminal Relationship Chart. And he first published it privately a year and a half ago, and he's been saving it for when there's a constitutional crisis. And so instead of paying $8 for this uh, previously, if you go to the Wayne Madsen report, you can download it for free, and you'll see what I'm talking about. This is mafia relationships, money laundering that extend throughout Trump world. And once you, and also I've got a link to it on the Justice Dash Integrity Org site, um, and you'll see that Trump's mentor, literally as well as attorney, was Roy Cohn, who who was the mouthpiece for three of the top five mafia families. Uh, yes, yeah, we know that the, uh, we know the Trump family. We know that Trump's father, Fred was deeply involved. We've had David K. Johnston and um, uh, Craig Unger on the show. Yes. So we know those mafia ties are very, very real. Well, is there any way you can sneak into Mueller's office and kind of grab a copy of that report? And, and Well, and we're not sure. Um, it's not certain he's working through a report. He probably is. But the thing to look for most immediately is indictments, because that's how he, he works. He indicts people. And he had to hold off for seven weeks before the elections. But what's what the crisis point now is, he's probably got a bunch of new indictments that need to be signed off on by the Justice Department. And by the way, the tip that I got that didn't quite pan out 
was I got a tip that news crews were at the federal courthouse a couple blocks from me because supposedly R- Rosenstein's personal attorney was there uh, filing something perhaps against Whitaker uh, in a constitutional challenge. Uh, I didn't yes, see any the sign of that. challenge brewing uh, to his appointment because it wasn't approved by the Senate. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, Mueller might set up some of this stuff to the Attorney General of New York and let New York do the Well, they're already working together, and they just had an election with a new Attorney General, Letitia James, uh, is just uh, on deck. In the meantime, Barbara Underwood, uh, the interim Attorney General, is working away. But when people say, what is Mueller doing? Well, he, he and New York couldn't do anything, or then they'd be criticized for doing something before the election. Wow. Hey, this is, so where do people go to get your, your stuff and Wayne Madsen's stuff? Real quick. Well, again, uh, justice-integrity.org is for my investigative project uh, that, founded eight okay. years ago to look into this stuff. Wayne Madsen is the Wayne Madsen Report. I believe it's WMR.org, but people can okay. look it up and get a copy Great. of Great, thank you so much. Report. Steve Rosenfeld, was John Brady, Clifford Kaiser. Amazing time. Eve? We'll see you next we week on Solotopia. From what we conceived. Either way, we got what we needed when the sun shone down on the Garden of Eden. <laughs>